As Donald Trump campaigns for the office that he tried to steal in the last election, the Supreme Court's weighing whether his role in the January 6th riot disqualifies him from the race. In a federal appeals court ruled this week that Trump is not immune from the federal criminal charges he faces for the insurrection. A new Frontline documentary explores the roots of the case. The president's intent was to stay in power at all costs. This election was stolen. The select committee laid the path down for the Department of Justice. The film is called Democracy on Trial, and the director, producer, and writer, Michael Kirk, joins me now. Thank you for being here. Great to be here, Adam. So did working on this film make you more or less optimistic about the future of our country? This is the seventh or eighth film I've made about the Trump presidency in one form or another, including the choice, our quadrennial, every four-year big comparison of the candidates. Staple. I never, ever, ever felt positive <laughs> about American democracy during this time. It's always challenging, no matter who the president is, because we know so much about it. We get ourselves very involved when we make these big, long films, mm -hmm. and the White House is essentially our beat. So there's plenty of reason for pessimism, but there was even more reason once we started to follow Trump closely and all the way through election night. On, uh, on 2020. You spent a lot of time in this film reviewing the work that the January 6th committee did and talking with people who were steering that work behind the scenes, also people who we saw as witnesses, but you learn a little more about their perspective over the course of this film. And I want to play a little small piece of your conversation with, tell me if I get the pronunciation right, Rusty Bowers. Rusty Bowers. Rusty yes. Bowers, the Arizona Speaker of the House who was pressured by Donald Trump to endorse a slate of false electors and resisted that pressure. Let's take a look. For someone to ask me to deny my oath and just let the courts figure it out or let somebody else punt it to someone else is not something I will do. It's my oath. And, and I hope that I'll never break that. I know I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm certainly not a perfect witness. But I am a witness. Did any of the conversations that you had with the staffers from the committee or the people who testified before the committee change your perspective on the committee's work and achievements? I had watched the hearings live, the sort of mini-series that were created out of those hearings, unlike any Washington hearing I'd ever seen. I started when I was in college watching the Watergate hearings, so I'm used to those kind of hearings. This, and I'd been in Washington lots of times for hearings. This one was very different, and they, they ran it almost like a TV show, almost like the TV show we made. They brought and in a producer, right? They did, from uh, ABC News, James Goldson, the former president of ABC News, and they really did make it uh, with the intention of getting an audience. They did. They got 19 million people that very first night. That's equivalent to a Monday night football crowd uh, on television. So did it change my perspective? Uh, I'm not sure. I had seen it. What I loved was loved getting to know people like Mr. Bowers a lot better and understand the importance of the event to them. I think they didn't quite get to all of that in the hearings. We were much more interested in the behind the scenes and who was he and what was it about uh, of the character. And that really does come to the fore with all these people you talk about, what this meant to them, both people on the committee and people who worked right. with the committee. And he's an incredibly compelling character, i got to say. He really is. And it's an amazing thing that it gives, it, it, it changing perspective, by the way, it gives me a little optimism, a little optimism, a tiny bit of optimism for the future. When you see that three or four of the people that we interviewed in the film and that are in the film were people that Giuliani and or Trump tried to influence so that they would do something that from their perspective was illegal. But here's the kicker. They were Republicans. They were supporters of President Trump. Hardcore, in, in Rusty Bauer's case, also LDS. Very, very conservative. Very pro-Donald Trump. But at the moment that they're asking him to do something without any evidence, he, he faces this question of, do I break my oath? And that, to me, gave me great optimism for the future because in every case, the people who were Trump people working in state government, being asked to do something that they consider to be illegal, wouldn't change their opinion because it was breaking their oath. But at the same time, if you want to be negative, you can flip that around, right, and say this result, the outcome that we got out of this horrible period was contingent on so many people doing the right thing. And if we're in a similar situation, what are the odds that everyone who's being pressured is in fact going to resist that pressure? Well, that's the question, and that's the, that's the issue in a lot of ways because it is true that the, the second go-around for the Trump team, a, a new Trump team, 
that's helping him through this election is uh, working very hard, has worked very hard to populate state governments around the country, especially in the six big states that are in, really in play. Lots of everything else is all kind of, we know how it's going to go. But in six key states, Arizona, Wisconsin, Georgia, uh, those, uh, Pennsylvania, those places uh, have been, uh, there have been real efforts by the Republicans, uh, Trump Republicans, to uh, change the population of who will be deciding things uh, if there is another contested election. And I think it looks very clearly like there will be another contested election, it's no matter how it right? goes. Right, 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 because he's back. Uh, in terms of there being another contested election, one of the points raised in the film is the extent to which Trump's refusal to accept the outcome was telegraphed incredibly clearly in that year when he repeatedly said that the only way he would lose was if the election was fraudulent, said yes. it again and again and again, yes. and even in things he'd done before, like when he didn't win an Emmy for The Apprentice, and he claimed that it was a rigged decision process at the Emmys. That's right. So I, I'm wondering why you think so few people were inclined to take that scenario seriously before it played out. I, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but I thought it was plain as day. Yeah, he's, if he loses, he's going to say it wasn't legit. But not a lot of people and seemed to anticipate what was coming or really thought he would do it. Why do you think that is? Well, even, even I, who know him, I'm a sort of biographer. I'm a television yeah. version of the biographer. I ought to know. But when he said it that night, I remember shaking my head and saying, oh, my God, he really is going to do it because it is such an outrageous, never before uh, been done kind of a thing mm -hmm. that a, an American presidential candidate would say, uh, uh, th I won this election. You all saw it. I won the election when, in fact, we were all watching uh, as he wasn't winning the election, when, especially when the the uh, the votes from the mail in ballots and others were starting to be counted. So it was clear that he got the early hit. Uh, very obvious that what everybody, uh, the pollsters had been saying, which is wait for later in the evening, wait for right, we all what's going to happen. Gonna come. We all knew it, but he apparently didn't know it or didn't want to believe it or had no intention of knowing it or believing it. It's hard to get in his head, but it is obvious from his actions that he was ready to go. The Supreme Court right now is taking up the question of whether he is, in fact, eligible to run again under the 14th Amendment. You, at one point in the film, highlight David French, the conservative but anti-Trump commentator, talking about the importance of that particular case. Let's take a look. The questions being raised right now regarding presidential immunity are absolutely key to the very foundation, the very philosophical foundation of this republic. Because if you take an oath of office in the United States of America, you're swearing an oath to our system of government. And so if a president is not subject to that system of government, if he's not subject to that code of laws, we don't have quite the republic that we thought we had. You are a documentarian, not a prognosticator, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are as the court takes this up and what you think the consequences will be uh, if they say he can run again and if they say he can't in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, it only took me two and a half hours to get to the, this exact point uh, in, in the movie. It's, uh, it, 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 you know, it's anybody's guess what he'll do. Uh, he loves this attention, whatever it is. And unless he's knocked off all the ballots at once, he's... Uh, his intention is to use the courts and use the trials, not as a prosecution, but as a persecution. I know he's using those anterooms right outside of courthouses as campaign stops along the way. It's fascinating to watch him do it. Uh, he is not intimidated and never has been going all the way back to Jim Comey and, and Bob Mueller. He is not intimidated by all of this uh, uh, rule of law uh, stuff. He doesn't believe in the rule of law and he's not going to follow the rules. All right. On that note, Michael Kirk, thank you very much. Appreciate it. The film is excellent. Thank you.